Okay, I guess we will get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, being willing to uh, go online and watch the Zoom tonight rather than in person. As you can hear, my voice is still not 100%, so we may cut it a little short tonight. Uh, and we'll just dive into it right away with the, this week's tour portion. We conclude uh, Sefer Bereshit. We conclude the book of Genesis. The last Parsha is called Vayechi and talks about the end of the life of Jacob and then the end of the lives of the, uh, all of the uh, ancestors of ancient Israel, uh, the 12 tribes, leading up to uh, Sefer Shemot, the book of Exodus. And um, we have a couple of very interesting points. First of all, J uh, Jacob is uh, growing old and uh, is nearing death. And so it's told about that to Joseph. And Joseph brings his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, with him to get his father's blessings for, for them. And uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, the older of the two is Manasseh, and Ephraim is the younger. Uh, but Jacob, perhaps, as kind of a symbol of the reality of his life, uh, when it comes time to bless the boys, he takes his right hand and puts it on uh, Ephraim, who is on his left side. And Manasseh, he crosses over like this. See, Joseph had set him up so that his firstborn son would be at Jacob's right hand. So his right hand would go on the firstborn son, and his left hand would go on the secondborn son. But Jacob reverses it. All right? He crosses his hands, and Joseph tries to change it. No, no, no. This is what I want. Uh, and that's why, interestingly enough, on Friday night, the traditional blessing, which is mentioned here in this Torah portion, is uh, 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 for sons. God should make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim being mentioned first, Manasseh being mentioned second. Uh, it's also significant that later on, we know that when the uh, kingdom breaks up and you have the northern tribes of Israel versus Judah in the south, Ephraim is the major tribe in that uh, confederation. And oftentimes the prophets refer to Ephraim without even mentioning the other tribes. Uh, all right, so beginning back to Joseph and Jacob. So Jacob blesses Ephraim and Manasseh, and he, then he blesses Joseph, uh, uh, and saying, the God in whose ways my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who's been my shepherd from my birth to this day, the angel who's redeemed me from all harm, bless the lads, in them my name be recalled, and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they be teeming multitudes upon the earth. Okay, so he sets this up. And Jacob says, your two sons who have been born to you already, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh, they will be equal to the other sons. All right? Uh, and um, any children that you have later on, after Jacob comes down to Egypt, uh, will be their inheritance would be connected with their brothers. Uh, and that leads to the confusion that when we talk about the 12 tribes, what do we mean when we say the 12 tribes? We have the 12 sons of Jacob, okay, Joseph being one. All right, so if Joseph is one of the tribes, the 12 tribes include Joseph and Benjamin, and then the rest of the brothers. If Ephraim and Manasseh take Joseph's place, it almost gives like 13 tribes. And when the land is divided, it's divided through the, for the 12 tribes. Joseph, uh, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh each getting a portion. And the tribe of Levi, the Levites, Levitical group, are not given a portion in the land. So when it comes to counting the 12, I'm, I'm personally I'm always confused as which are the 12 that we're counting. Sometimes you'll see Joseph with the two sons mentioned under his name. Sometimes you'll have the two brothers 
in exclusion, uh, 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 perhaps of Levi, but usually he's there. Now, uh, so now Jacob calls, uh, summons his other sons. And if you remember, and we're going to read about the Shema tonight, one of the uh, Midrashim say that when Jacob wanted to bless his sons, he wanted to tell them what was going to happen in the end. Okay? Uh, as it says in chapter 49, Jacob called his sons and said, come together that I may tell you what is to befall you in days to come. Now, the rabbis read that as not talking about the immediate future, but the messianic future. And God doesn't want Jacob to reveal, uh, reveal all of that. So God takes away his gift of prophecy, according to the rabbis. And Jacob feels that absence. So when, he come, when his sons are there, he said, well, maybe one of you haven't followed in my footsteps. Maybe you haven't been the way you're supposed to be. And so uh, the, the sons replied to him, no. Shema Yisrael, listen, Israel, our father, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Lord is our God, the Lord alone. So they tell him that to reinforce that they believe in, in, in the God of Israel. And so the Midrash ties that into this story. And a little later tonight, we're going to look at the Shema as it appears in Deuteronomy. So... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. So he blesses all of his sons. Each one of them gets a special uh, kind of praise, although in some cases it's not such a praise. It says, Shimon and Levi are a pair. Their weapons are tools of lawlessness. Let not my person be included in their council. Let not my being be counted in their assembly. For when angry, they slay men, and they please. when they please, they maim oxen. Cursed be their anger so fierce and their wrath so relentless. I will divide them in Jacob, scatter them in Israel. So the intimation here is that uh, Shimon, as well as Levi, will not be separate and distinct, but they'll be scattered amongst the other tribes. Thus, now taking Shimon out of the picture uh, of the 12 tribes uh, and putting Ephraim and Asha in. So, you, again, here's a kind of uh, uh, mishmash for the number 12. Also, we do know that, that the tribe of Shimon seems to be absorbed later on into the tribe of Judah uh, as time goes by. All right, so then uh, we uh, read uh, of Jacob's death. The uh, Egyptians uh, mummify him. Very unusual story. He's uh, mummified. And then he, he had made his children promise to bring his, his body to be buried in Kever Machpelah, where he buried Leah, his second wife, or actually his first wife, but not the one he loved the most. Uh, and Rebecca was not buried in Kever Machpelah in, in Hebron. Uh, and makes them promise to bring him back there. And then he dies. And then uh, we're told about the death of everybody else from that generation. And then finally, the last verses of the book of, Ex of, of Genesis, Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. And when Israel leaves Egypt at the time of the Exodus, we're told that they take the bones of Joseph with them to be brought back to the land of Israel. And uh, according to tradition, there's a, uh, a grave in Shechem where Joseph is buried. Now, traditionally, uh, on Shabbat morning, when we conclude a book of the Torah, uh, we recite uh, right after uh, the last lines, Chazak, Chazak beneath Chazek, be strong, be strong, let us strengthen one another. Uh, as a sign of the completion of that part of the Torah. So you will see that, God willing, when you make it to shul this weekend, I hope I make it to shul this weekend, I'm supposed to speak at a, a program Friday night at somebody's home. Uh, still planning on doing that. I should be okay by then. We'll be able to see that taking place. Okay. So... <coughs> Uh, 
we have we talked about the uh, first uh, few books of the Torah, uh, and uh, I asked you to look over uh, the books of uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy uh, for tonight. Uh, God willing, next week we'll get back to the Hebrew. I don't want to do that online right now. But hopefully, we'll be able to get back to the Hebrew next week. Uh, as you recall, the names of the books of the Torah uh, in Hebrew, they are always one of the opening words, the opening word, or one of the opening words. So the second, I mean, excuse me, the fourth book of the Torah is Bamidbar in the wilderness. It opens up with the words uh, by the Ber Hashem El Moshe Bamidbar Sinai. Hashem spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai. Uh, it's on the first day of the second month in the second year following the exodus from the land of Egypt. So everything we've read followed from the story of the exodus in, in, in the book of Exodus through Leviticus, the building of the tabernacle, the sacrificial system being established, all of that has brought us up to this point, and it's the first day of the second month in the second year following the Exodus. All right, so not much time has really passed uh, for the 40 years of wandering in the Midbar that we will talk about tonight, too. And once again, we have a census a number of times at important elements, important moments in the uh, narrative of the Torah. They make a census of the people. And this is one of those examples. And it's because of that census that follows right away, uh, we get the name in uh, from, uh, from the Latin Vulcate form of it, the Book of Numbers. Because uh, it says uh, after a few verses, Suad Rosha Kaladap and Nay Israel and Mishpachotam, Levet of Atam, the Mispadashem Mot. Take a sense of the whole Israelite community by the clans of his ancestral houses, listening names every male head by head. Although in the Hebrew is by the number listing is they uh, translate listening names, but it's literally it's the mispar shemot, with the numbers are in the numbers of the names. And so the say from the midbar in English is called the book of numbers for uh, the fact that it enumerates uh, the, the numbers of the people of Israel. Uh, so we start off with the census. Uh, we have various uh, uh, other uh, passages uh, in uh, this uh, section of the Torah that we're going to skip over. I just want to talk about a, a couple in uh, chapter uh, 13 we have uh, in Shlach Lecha, we have the story of the Maraglim of the spies uh, the Lord spoke to Moses saying send men to scout the land of Canaan which I'm giving to these Israelite people send one man from each of the ancestral tribes each one a chieftain among them so we're told that God tells Moses to send out spies. Uh, the rabbis struggle with this a little bit. From later on, it seems to imply that this was not really the choice of God, but it was really the choice of Israel, and it showed a lack of faith in God. Uh, but we'll just take it uh, as it is here. Uh, and so we're listed the names of the leaders of the various tribes, uh, Ruvain, uh, Shimon, Judah, Yisachar, uh, uh, Ephraim, uh, uh, etc. Okay, uh, and they go and they scout out the land, and we're told that um, they start in the south and work their way north uh, into the hill country. And it was during the season of the first ripening of the grapes. And so they bring back this huge cluster of grapes, takes two men 
with a cluster of grapes on this one pole, the two men carrying those grapes. And that has become the sign of the Israel Tours uh, ministry. Uh, guys, two guys walking with the staff and the grapes hanging down. So we're told, they, they, they initially come back and say, it's a, uh, where is it? And the end of 40 days, keep that in mind, 40 days, they returned from scouting the land. They went straight to Moses and Aaron and report to them. This is what they told them. We came to the land you sent us to it. It indeed does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So they bring some of the samples of it. By the way, whenever it says milk flowing with milk and honey, milk is milk, probably goat's milk. The honey, though, is not bees' honey. The honey is date honey, date jam. It's about halalu devash, a land flowing with milk and honey is always actually a reference to date honey, not to bees honey. Uh, you can put that in your packet away somewhere to remember. And, and when somebody talks about the land of milk and honey, you can tell them what it's really talking about. All right, so now, yeah, it's a fruitful country, but the people inhabit the country are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. You know, wherever we saw the Anakites there, and Amalekites dwell in the Negev, Hittites, so, so, we can't do it. It's a beautiful country, but they're they're too strong for us. They lose heart. So now Caleb, who was uh, the uh, for the tribe of Judah, uh, goes up and says, "No, we can do it." Uh, and people said, "No, we can't. Uh, we cannot attack the people, for they're stronger than we." Thus they spread calumnies among the Israelites about the land they had scouted, saying, "The country we have traveled and scouted is one that devours its settlers." And the people we saw in it are men of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The Anakites are part of the Nephilim. And we look like grasshoppers to ourselves, and so we must have looked to them. Right? We were nothing compared to them. And they're all grieving and crying, and they wept all night, and the people are upset, and they're organizing against Moshe. And they said, let's go back to Egypt. And then Jay, and then Jew, uh, and Caleb and Joshua uh, support uh, uh, Moshe and uh, says, no, we can do it. God will, set, will lead us to it. All right. So. We're, we've got this disheartened uh, group. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people spurn me? And how long will they have no faith in me, despite all the signs that I performed in their midst? I will strike them down with pestilence and disown them. And I will make you a nation far more numerous than they. So he offers to, to uh, replace the children of Israel with Moses and his family. But Moses says, no, forgive them. Uh, and later on, he goes, all right, I will pardon you. He asked, nevertheless, as I live. And as the Lord's presence fills the whole world, none of the men who have seen my presence and the signs that I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and who have tried me these many times and have disobeyed me shall see the land that I promised on oath to their fathers. None of those who spurn me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he was imbued with a different spirit, remained loyal to me. Him will I bring into the land that he entered and his offspring shall hold it as a possession. All right, and uh, so only Caleb and Joshua are going to be able to survive. So God says, since you uh, spent 40 days uh, searching out the land and came back this way, you should bear your, bear your punishment for 40 years, corresponding to the number of days, 40 days that you scoured the land, a year for each day. So the punishment was that a whole generation or two generations, anybody over the age of 20 uh, would die out before they reached the land of Israel. And for the 40 years span, you know, 60 years old was not a new, you know, uh, it was a fairly good uh, lifespan in those days. But the number 40, as it's used uh, frequently in the Bible, is sort of like we might say dozens. There were dozens of people there. When I say there were dozens of people, does that mean 24? Does it mean 36? You know, which means a lot of people without giving you an exact figure. 
And many modern scholars have believed that when the number 40 is used in the Bible, it's meant as that kind of a number, <coughs> a large number without being specific. But it clearly parallels and are told, 40 days you spied out the land, 40 years you'll die in the wilderness. And this is already the second year. So they've already expanded uh, the first year of the wandering in the wilderness. So it's only another 39 years uh, left. And the, the Midrash uh, fancifully says that every night for the next 40 years, uh, 39 years, really, they would dig their graves every night. And they would lie in their grave at night. And in the morning, if they woke up, okay, good, we can go on with the day. If they didn't wake up, they just covered up, put the dirt over, and that was the end of the story. And they knew that the, the punishment was over when everybody got up in the, after that last night and uh, nobody got left in the grave that overnight. But that's a midrash. Okay. So we're told them Israel gets upset. They want to try and conquer the land. They get beaten when they try to do it. We're then, uh, not long after that, we have the story of Korach. Uh, uh, in chapter 16, Korach leads a rebellion against Moses' leadership. Uh, and uh, it's in the interest of itself, but we're not going to uh, go over the whole story. I, what I want to touch upon is another story that we find in uh, Sefer of the Midbar in the Book of Numbers, the story of, of Bilaam. In chapter 22, we're told that Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. This, this is already now some time has passed, and they're almost ready to enter into uh, the land of Israel. It's growing close to that time. And so all of a sudden, these, these years go by. They flow by so fast. The, 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 the Torah doesn't really tell us what happens during this period of time, right? So they've conquered uh, lands on the uh, eastern side of the Jordan River, uh, parts of what today are uh, the land of Jordan. And uh, Balak, uh, who was the king of Moab, was afraid it was gonna happen. So he sends messengers to a man by the name of Bilaam. Bilaam is, is, is said to be a prophet of God. Uh, Bilaam, the son of Baor and Petor, which is by the Euphrates in the land of his kinsfolk, to invite him saying, there's a people uh, coming here, put a curse on the people for me since they are too numerous for me. Perhaps I can thus defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed indeed. And he whom you curse is cursed. Okay. So we're introduced to a man by the name of Bilaam, who seems to be a prophet, a prophet of the, of the Gentile world. And so uh, what happens is, is that uh, uh, Balak sends messengers and when, when they come to Bilaam, Bilaam says, I can't do anything unless God tells me to. So uh, he says, spend the night and I'll see what God wants. And he says, God came to Bilaam and said, what do these people want of you? Bilaam said to God, Balak, son of Sipor, king of Moab, sent me this message. And he tells about the people and I want to drive them off. But God said to Bilaam, do not go with them. You must not curse that people, for they are blessed. Mm -hmm. So um, he uh, then tells the, the messenger, sorry, Charlie, can't do it. God told me no. Goes back to, to Balak, and Balak sends more messengers and with more gifts uh, to him. And he says, I will reward you richly, and I will do anything you ask of me, only come and damn this people for me. So once again, Bilaam says to the messengers, you know, I have to see what God says. So that night, God said, came to Bilaam and said to him, if these men have come to invite you, you may go with them. But whatever I command you, that you shall do. So it, uh, as we'll see in a moment, it's sort of like, you know, sometimes parents would tell the children, well, if you want to really do that, you can do it. 
you know, but you know they don't want you really doing it. And, but, you know, as a parent, every parent's done that sometime or another, right? So um, he gets up in the morning and Bilaam saddled his ass and departed with the Moabite dignitaries. But God was incensed at his going. So an angel of the Lord placed himself in the way as an adversary. By the way, this is the word Satan, or Satan, the same word as Satan. So God's not happy with this. He sets up an angel to block the path. Um, and uh, he says he was riding on a she-ass with his two servants alongside. When the ass caught sight of the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand, the ass swerved from the road and went into the fields, and Bilaam beat the ass to turn her back to the road. The angel of the Lord then stationed himself in a lane between the vineyards with a fence on either side. The ass, seeing the angel of the Lord, pressed himself against the wall and squeezed Bilaam's foot against the wall, so he, so he beat him again. Once more, the angel of the Lord moved forward and stationed himself on the spot so narrow there was no room to swerve right or left. When the ass now saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Bilaam, and Bilaam was furious and beat the ass with his stick. And now comes the, the, the magic moment. Then the Lord opened the ass's mouth and she said to Bilaam, what have I done to you that you have beat me these three times? Bilaam said to the ass, you have made a mockery of me. If I had a sword with me, I'd kill you. The ass said to Bilaam, look, I'm the ass that you've been riding all along until this day. Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? And he answered, no. And then God uncovers uh, Bilaam's eyes and he can see the angel of the Lord. <coughs> How do we take this? Uh, Certainly some of the rabbinic uh, scholars of old just took it literally. There's a statement in, in, uh, in Pirkei Avot that amongst the 10 things that were created at the uh, very beginning of the world was uh, this ass who spoke to Bilaam, uh, recognizing that's not a normal kind of a thing. Maimonides, the rationalist, notes the fact that first of all we see that when God visits Bilaam he only visits him at night obviously in a dream and most of the time in the Bible it seems that uh, prophetic visions are take place at night when the prophet is sleeping and the the language of the story here leaves out a lot of things you know, one moment he's with all these messengers from Midian and the next minute it's just him and his two servants and the next thing is just him and the talking ass So the Rambam Maimonides says it's all just a vision. It didn't really happen. Don't take it literally. All right. But nonetheless, so what happens is God says to Bill, okay, you want to go, go. But remember, only what I tell you to say can you say. And so what happens is he goes, uh, tells uh, Balak to build the altars, make sacrifices to God. He gets ready to talk, gets ready to curse Israel. Instead of cursing Israel, he praises Israel. Balak gets upset with Bilaam and he says, well, I came, you were supposed to curse them, not praise them. And he says, right, let's try it again. Same thing. Try it again. Same thing. And then finally gives up. So that uh, Bilaam cannot curse Israel. Uh, and indeed, one of the lines that uh, when Bilaam seeks to curse Israel, uh, he, he lifts up his eyes. And he says, uh, How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. The, these are the words that we're supposed to recite when we enter into the synagogue for the first time in the morning. So in any case, uh, Bilaam does not end up cursing Israel. Uh, we have other stories of, of, of advice. That, that, yes. Uh, that's a great story. It's Lauren speaking. Yeah, um, I, what's the meaning of that? What's the what's the essence of this parable? What are we supposed to learn from it besides a oh. charming tale of a talking ass? That sounds <laughs> cool. Um, and the fact that God can produce certain words out of a magician's mouth. But what are we supposed to learn from that? Well, I think what we're supposed to learn, number one, is that the idea of prophecy that people can speak to God, get messages from God, is not limited to the Jewish people, despite uh, Judah Halevi later on. Bilaam is described as being a prophet. 
He's a bad guy and no good Nick, and he gets his in the end. But the idea that God speaks to only Israel is contradicted by this. Secondly, we can't always uh, know for sure what we're beholding, what we're seeing. You know, you have this story. That here, here's a man who thinks he knows the will of God, and yet he can't see an angel, which his ass can. And he thinks he's superior to this animal, and the animal sees something he can't see. So I think one of the messages is, is possible to say is that we're not necessarily that much better than the animals around us. We think we are. We're on a higher plane. Sometimes we're not. Another one is that, that ultimately what the fate of the world, at least according to this biblical account, comes through God. You may want to do something different. But in the end, if you're going to, to really speak on behalf of God, you can only say what God tells you. That's how I look at it. Uh, now, certainly, another way of looking at these, some of these stories, these side stories, and we'll see that when we look at the book of Judges, is you can see it also as folk tales that... Uh, almost like around the campfire sort of thing to help explain uh, some of the things in the world around us. Maybe that is part of the message. I don't know. But I, I think essentially the, the thing to really take from it, God is not only speaks to the Jewish people, he can speak to all of, of the world, that we have to be aware that we may not see everything around us and understand everything around us uh, as a matter of fact just recently uh i, I i've come across well i think uh one of the rabbis the sermons I, I was listening to was talking about uh psychological experiments that suggest that we don't really see the entire world around us we only see elements of it there's much there that we don't see, that we can't see. That's almost for the mystical thing. But it, it, this is a this is a non-theologian, non-theist psychologist who suggests we only see part of the world around us. There's much of it that we miss. <coughs> I, I'd say it's the world is flat, right? Well, I don't know. The, the, I, 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 you know, that's what I see when I look out the window. Granted. And you act like it's flat when you're walking. We see what we need to see. Is it what his argument is, by the way? This is, I, 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 I find it fast. I was listening to it on YouTube and, and he lost me when uh, eventually and I gave up on it. But he's trying to say that, that uh, our uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Evolution. The evolution of the human being creates a, a, a way of seeing the world that helps us, but is not necessarily the full vision of the world around us. I was going to say, it's almost like going back to the Platonic idea of those of you who remember story, Plato talks about people being in a cave and they have their backs to a fire and all they see is shadows on the wall. And those shadows, they think, is what reality is. But it's really a, just the shadows from the light that's going across from behind them. That's all they see. They don't really see the true reality of the world around them. So um, maybe this is a platonic idea <laughs> that's in here. I don't know. But uh, it's a good question. You can ask, you know, uh, Many commentaries are, uh, in Midrashim or whatever seek to find lessons in the various stories. I always like this one only because it, it, it illustrates that there are two ways of looking at uh, the story. One is to take it quite literally, in which case now you got to believe in a, talk, a talking donkey. Uh, what was that? Um, and the, after the Second World War, there was a, 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 a movie thing, uh, not Mr. Ed, that was on television later on. Wil oh, it was Wilbur the Talking Mule, I don't know. But anyhow, you have to believe that, 
Or you see, on the other hand, a very rationalist approach of the Rambam, who says it's all visions. And not to take it literally that it really happened that way. So that's why I like this story. Not because of the other things, but because it shows that there are two different ways of looking at the same story from our tradition. One seeing it as a more literal rendition and the other seeing it more as a uh, metaphorical vision rather than reality. That's why I like the story. Okay. Um, there are many other things in the Book of Numbers that we are not going to go over, uh, but uh, I want to just touch upon the, the last of the five books of Moses, Sefer Deuteronomy, Sefer Devarim. Now, Sefer Devarim opens with the words, Elahad Devarim, these are the words. Deuteronomy, Devarim, that's the second word in this uh, introduction. In English, we call it Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is actually, in this case, a translation of another Hebrew name for the of work, Mishnah Torah, the second Torah, or the repetition of the Torah. Deuteronomia means second uh, statement or second knowledge. Um, and it's called that because there are many things in here that seem to repeat what we've come across earlier in the Bible, especially uh, laws in the book of Exodus, as we will look at when we look at the Ten Commandments. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the rabbis assume that there can be no simple repetition in the Torah. Anything that seems to be a repetition has to be coming along to teach us something new, something different. It's not meant to be repetitious. And uh, therefore, uh, we begin with, a, 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 these are the words that Moses addressed to all Israel on the other side of the Jordan. The scene is set at the end of, of Sefer Bamidbar, Israel is almost ready to cross the Jordan River. The 39 years, the 40 years of wandering are over. Moses, Moshe dies by the end of Sefer Devarim. Uh, and most of Deuteronomy is pictured as being speeches that Moshe gives, reviewing what took place before, reviewing the laws and things as that, in that nature. And we're told it was in the 40th year on the first day of the 11th month, that would be the first day of the month of Adar, that Moses addressed the Israelites in accordance with the instructions that the Lord had given him for them. After he had defeated Sichon, the king of the Amorites, who dwelt in the Heshbon, and King Og of Bashan, who dwelt at Ashtarot, and Edrei, on the other side of the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this teaching. He said, by the way, this is where uh, some suggest that that's why this is called the Torah, because he explains this Torah. All right, so now he, he reviews what took place after they left uh, Mount Sinai, but here it's called Choref. Uh, and uh, tells about some of the stories and about the, the spies going out and coming back. Uh, and the fact that now the, all the generation has died off and the leading up to uh, the most recent events uh, that have taken place. And then uh, in chapter three, uh, we uh, are told uh, that Moses pleads with God to let him enter the land. God says, no, sorry, Charlie, you're not going to be able to go in. And so we get to chapter five. We have the repetition now of the Yaserah uh, Tadibrot, the, the Ten Commandments, as it were. All right. 
since I'm home. Uh, where are we? There we go. Since I got this, I can do it like this. Okay. I gave you a copy of this, but I wanted to show you how uh, the two versions of the Ten Commandments compare with each other. Okay. Uh, now, I said that uh, according to the language of Deuteronomy, this is all Moshe speaking. So that accounts for the second person that is sometimes used here rather than the first person. Uh, but in any case, I said, I, Lord, your God, brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage, the land of the gods before me. You see, that's identical. Okay. No sculptured in image, uh, not to bow down to them. All right, so um, for I, the Lord your God, am an impassioned God, visiting the guilt of the parents upon the children, upon the third and fourth generations, those who reject me. So again, sim uh, similar. And then and the third statement is similar. Now, number four, the Sabbath day, that's where we start to see the major difference. You see, even the, in the English, the, the length here versus the length here. Whoops. And what longer it is. All right. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Zachor et Yom HaShabbat. Remember the Sabbath day. Now, according to the rabbis, Zachor means all of the positive things that we're supposed to do for Shabbat. To light the candles, to make the kiddush. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. Shemorat Yom HaShabbat Lekadusho is talking about the negative commandments. Uh, to observe, not to violate the laws of, of the, the Shabbat. Right? Six days shall you labor and do all your work. Right? Here, it, 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 it's a little bit extra. Here, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. But then, all right, you should not do work. Everybody's included there. Now, here comes the big cut. Here is where it changes. For in six days, this is Exodus, the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So, as I mentioned before, this is the cosmic explanation of Shabbat. We observe Shabbat because it is a reminder of God's creation of the universe. Uh, however, in Deuteronomy's, right, uh, we are told, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Lord your God freed you from there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. It's a social contract. It's a social ideal. We were slaves in Egypt, and therefore, we, and since God freed us, he didn't free us completely, in a sense. He freed us, but he took us. So he is our master. And uh, we observe the Sabbath because God freed us. All right. And then pretty much the same. Then here we have a slight different uh, wording in the covet, but it's pretty much the same otherwise. Now, how do we account for this difference? How do we account for this uh, changeover? So, um, first of all, uh, the commentaries spend a lot of ink trying to resolve the, uh, the differences. Uh, if you think about it, on Friday night, uh, the Lacha Dodi, it starts off with the word shamor v'zachor b'dibur echad ishmianu el hamyuchad. The word shamor, observe, v'zachor, and remember, it was said at one simultaneous time. The unified God, the one God, told us those two words simultaneously. It, and uh, many in the tradition say somehow, miraculously, Whatever differences appeared in the Aserat Hatibrot in Deuteronomy versus Shmot, 
we heard them simultaneously and they just got written down in the two separate versions. Now, if you don't want to accept a more miraculous explanation, one of the modern uh, explanations, remember when we talked about the concept of the documentary hypothesis, that the Torah is really an amalgam of various sources. One of those sources is said to be Sefer Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy. In uh, the book of Kings, we're told how towards the end of the Judean state in the 600s BCE, repair was made on the temple in Jerusalem and they found a copy of the Torah uh, and uh, which was ignored until then, uh, were unaware of it. And it talks about them celebrating Passover in accordance with the laws found in that book. Uh, some identify that as the origin of Deuteronomy. Others identify it as meaning it was the Torah, entire Torah itself that was found. Regardless of that, the, the uh, according to the documentary hypothesis, this was a collection of laws that were different from that found in Exodus. And so when you have contradictions, the simple answer is, well, because they have different traditions. So you can take whichever way you want to go. Uh, if you're a traditionalist, you will say, no, somehow they are reunited together. Uh, Ibn Ezra, in his commentary, uh, suggests that if we heard, you know, if God spoke, the, it's one thing to say God spoke two words simultaneously because God doesn't speak. Not in the sense that we speak. Well, you know, we speak, we, air comes out of our mouth, it goes over our larynx, etc., God has none of those bodily features. So when we say God spoke, we mean that God communicated with us in some fashion that we describe as speech, but not that God really spoke. So and Ibn Ezra says, that's not the big, the big miracle would not be that God could say something simultaneously. The big miracle is that we could hear and distinguish two different things simultaneously. So he suggests, no, that it, that this is Moshe, it seems to be what he's saying is that Moshe wrote this down. Sometimes the same idea can be expressed in a little different ways. And so it's expressed a little bit different way here, expressed a little bit a different way there, but it's not meant to be contradictory, but supplementary one of the other. Right. And that's how Ibn Ezra uh, seeks to deal with this particular issue of the versions of the Aseret Hadibrot. Now, we also find here, we have the Shema uh, mentioned in Deuteronomy. This is where the first paragraph of the Shema is to be found. Uh, in chapter 6, uh, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Uh, you shall hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and might. The first paragraph of the Shema is, is found here. And we've talked about the Shema before, so I'm not going to go into any great depth uh, with it here. But it's in the first paragraph, we're, we're told the basic idea is acceptance of God uh, as our, our Lord and to love God and then to uh, teach our children about all of this. The second paragraph of the Shema is found a little bit later on, again in Sefer Devarim. In chapter 11, beginning with verse 13, shall be that if you listen uh, carefully to my commandments, which I command you this day, etc. Now, 
this is clearly uh, has within it a very clear theology. This theology is that if we observe the mitzvot, if we observe God's commandments, then God will reward us in this world. I will grant the rain for your land in season, the early rain and the late. This is a reference to the, the, uh, uh, the way rains fall in the land of Israel. You shall gather in your new grain and wine and oil and also provide grass in the fields for your cattle and thus shall you eat your fill. All right? So if we listen to God's word, we will be rewarded in the here and now. We're talking about a, a community that was agricultural in nature and therefore the rewards are listed as very agricultural kinds of rewards. And conversely, take care not to be lured away to serve other gods and bow to them for the Lord's anger will flare up against you. And he will shut up the sky so there will be no rain. And the ground will not yield its produce. And you shall soon perish from the good land the Lord has assigned to you. All right, so we're told this is what, again, modern scholars, modern biblical uh, critics, uh, speak of the Deuteronomic theology. Very clear theology that says God rewards and punishes in this world. No mention... I'm sorry, well, Rabbi. Isn't there a risk if you if you follow the commandments and you follow what you're supposed to do, and then the harvest doesn't come in? Ah, that's the problem. A whole bunch of, it's a it's a problem, isn't it? A hard promise to keep, or is it a promise that's very convenient for the priests to say, "Well, the harvest didn't come in because you might have thought that you were doing a good job, but clearly you weren't because if you were, the harvest would have come in." It's a bit of a tautology. Of course, you are very correct. And by the way, that's why we see in later on in the Bible, you take, uh, we will see in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes seems to reject this theology. Clearly, the book of Job later on says good people suffer. Um, and I, I'm sure that's that this idea here is very problematic. You're right, you can, you know, you make excuses. Well, you know, you didn't realize you had sinned. You didn't realize you've done this wrong, you've done that wrong, what have you, okay? Uh, and so, yeah, the priest can get away with, with all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, say, you know, proof positive. If, you, if you've suffered, you did wrong. How do I know you did wrong? Because you're suffering. If you didn't do wrong, you wouldn't be suffering. End of story, end of argument, QED, right? You're right. That's a problem. And in Job, that's a debate between Job and his friends. Job says, I'm innocent. I did nothing wrong, but I'm suffering. And Job's friends say to him, no, you must have done something wrong or you wouldn't be suffering. So we'll see how the book of Job deals with that later on in the Bible. Because exactly that's the problem. Uh, there are two mitzvot that are found in the Torah that are given uh, rewards spilled out for them. Uh, that if you obey your parents, on your, you are granted long life. If you obey them, uh, you will be granted long life. And there's a mitzvah, Shiloh Ken. That when you go out and you have wild birds and you have birds that are sitting on fledglings or sitting on eggs, you have to shoo away the mother bird before you take the eggs. So famously, there's a story in the Talmud that says uh, Elisha ben Abuya, one of the great rabbis, saw a, 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 a man tell his son, go up into the tree, shoo away the birds and get the eggs and bring them down to me. So the kid goes up in the tree, shoes away the mother's bird, gets the eggs, falls out of the tree and dies. So he was fulfilling two mitzvot. Both of those mitzvot say you'll be granted long life. And the kid dies. And for that reason, according to the Talmud, Elisha ben Abuya became a heretic. Right? Because the world it doesn't seem to operate that simply. So that's a challenge. That's the challenge of the Deuteronomistic uh, theology. That's a challenge of any kind of theology that says 
that if you do good, you'll be rewarded. If you do bad, you will be punished. At least in the here and now. If you talk about something beyond this world, then you open the door for other kinds of explanations. And when we talk about life and death later on, and life after death or what have you, the theology is behind it, we will we'll examine it again. But essentially what uh, the idea of reward and punishment is then changed from reward and punishment in this world to reward and punishment for the most part in the world to come. And if you're a good guy, whatever punishments are due to you, you'll get in this world, but what therefore, so that all you will get in the world to come will be reward. If you're a bad guy, whatever good you've done in this world is rewarded in this world, so that when you die, all that you'll get will be punishments in the world to come. Exactly because of that problem. Thank you for raising it. Okay. Uh, Deuteronomy, though, continues with this theme, this, this theme, this idea of reward and punishment. Uh, I, I am not trying to paper over it. Deuteronomy, the whole background of Deuteronomy, and we'll see the same thing appearing in uh, the book of Judges, is a close connection between what we do and what happens to us in this world, uh, etc. Um I just want to touch upon uh, a couple of other items and then we're going to call it an evening. <coughs> when I was a, yeah, I think it was a, my first pulpit as a very young rabbi. Uh, we had visitors come to the synagogue from a Catholic school. And um, I remember uh, was it chapter 25? Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, this discussion and I mentioned to, uh, to this class that the book of Deuteronomy uh, uh, sanctions divorce. And some one of the nuns was very shocked with this and uh, said, no, no, the Bible doesn't permit divorce. The Bible doesn't permit divorce. Well, if you turn to chapter 24 of Deuteronomy, it says a man takes a wife and possesses her. She fails to please him because he finds something obnoxious about her and he writes her a bill of divorcement, hands it to her and sends her away from his house. She leaves his household and becomes a wife of another man. All right. So it's just it's descriptive. It's not prescriptive. This, right now it's descriptive. Guy, uh, they break up. The man gives his wife a gift. She doesn't say that. She says he, he uh, writes her a bill of divorce, say for kritut in Hebrew. And she goes, now she can marry somebody else. It's clearly spelled out. Now, if something happens in that marriage, she can't go back to the first husband. Right? That's, that's what, it's, what it's all about here. They don't want a woman going back and forth between two men. All right? But it assumes divorce. It doesn't tell us anything about it. It doesn't tell us what it constitutes. Uh, and the rabbis use this as the basis of it, but it's not, you know, it's very unclear as to what in the entirety is there. All right. As I said, Deuteronomy is a series of speeches of Moshe Rabbeinu before his death. It opens up on the first day of the month of Adar. And we're told uh, in the last chapter of Deuteronomy, uh, Moses went up from the steps of Moab to Mount Nebo to the summit of Pisgah opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, the whole land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negev and the plain, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will assign it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your own eyes, but you shall not cross there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the command of the Lord. He buried him in the valley of the land of Moab near Bet Peor. No one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died, his eyes undimmed and his vigor unabated. And the Israelites uh, bewailed Moses 
in the steps of Moab for 30 days. Okay. Uh, so, and then was the finish, the time is over, then we described how, uh, well, let me just read it. The period of wailing and mourning for Moses came to an end. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands upon him and the Israelites heeded him doing all as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never again did there rise in Israel a prophet like Moses and the Lord singled out face to face the various signs and portents that the Lord sent him to display in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his courtiers and his whole country and for all the great might and awesome power that Moses displayed before all Israel. So that be, ends the book of Deuteronomy. Moses dies, his burial place is unknown. Uh, we said that the beginning of the book was on the beginning of the month of Adar, according to tr one tradition, this is the seventh Adar. Moses was born in the seventh Adar and he dies on the seventh of Adar. Uh, and just a note, as I said earlier, uh, according to rabbinic tradition, there's an argument as to who wrote these last uh, verses, these last 11 lines. In Deuteronomy, some say it was Moses with his tears in his eyes, others say it was Joshua. <coughs> in any case, it concludes the story uh, of Israel's before entering the land of Israel. And what follows after that is in the rest of the Tanakh uh, will be the story of Israel in the land of Israel and then the loss of the land of Israel. Okay. Are there any kinds of questions anybody has? No. All right. In that case, God willing, we will meet next week in person. Uh, hope to see everybody there at uh, Beth Emmeth. And you have a good night, okay? Feel better, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very a much. lot, Rabbi. Cheers. Cheers.